Hey guys, welcome to the 90 Plus channel. We have with us today Shabir Zaki, the inimical Shabir Zaki. And we're going to talk today about a primer on ideas. So it's essential with section two that you come into it with a, um, a context of some of the most important ideas that characterize and implicate the world around us, um, such that you can scaffold whatever ideas you have about the prompt uh, in the context uh, of that kind of broader narrative. So what Shabir and I want to do today is in the shortest, most digested form possible, give to you guys an idea of how we got from where we were or where humanity was, say, pre the New World, pre Russian French Revolution, uh, to now. And the intention of that is to, to give you uh, a context that's going to help you write more effectively um, and and more richly about the world around you and obviously to score more highly. Um, so just a bit of background, my name is Michael Sunderland. I scored the highest uh, 91 in section 2, 82 overall, the 100th percentile of my sitting and Shabir is uh, actually my GAMSAT mentor and uh, I, I owe to him that score and a lot of other things. Thank you Shabir for, uh, for coming on and, and being with us today. It's a pleasure. I'm glad to glad to be here, Michael. Do you want to um, do you want to say a bit about your history uh, with Gamsat and your background, so people have kind of a context for who you are and, and what you bring to the table? Yeah, for sure, man. So I've been sort of teaching Section Two and Section One on and off for about nine years now, close to nine years. I started off with you know Fraser Gamsat tuition when it was a little tutoring um, uh, uh, firm, as it were, above a laundromat in Brunswick, right? So, like <laughs> amidst the whir of the washing machines, we're teaching people about. You know, like, Nietzsche nihilism, right? So it started off there, and then, like you know, the the phrase is picked off, and you know, now it's um, it's it's, it's a big gamsa company, and uh, uh, in all that time, I've been teaching section two, sort of honing my ideas. During that time, I completed degrees in philosophy and in education, which uh, helped me to you know just I suppose refine my teaching in this space. Yeah. Cool. Easy. So, man, a lot of what I'm actually going to talk about today, I, I got from you, and uh, one of the things that really helped me understand the world around me uh, was kind of the arc, you know, we discussed a bit about kind of a grand narrative that was forming, but that was more in the context of kind of the, you know, the Christian evangelical grand narrative of uh, the United States. But um, what I ultimately came to prior to my GAMSAT sitting was there was kind of a stratified uh, class system uh, rife with inequities that was the impetus um, for the French Revolution in part due to increased taxation uh, and the, the Russian Revolution later. Um, and out of those two things, kind of the, um, uh, well, not so much with the Russian Revolution, of course, but with the French Revolution, uh, kind of the um, inception of liberalism uh, and capitalism, the free press um, and ideas of liberty and um, equality that ultimately seeped through to uh, American revolutionaries and found their way into the American Constitution and, and obviously were um, uh, quite uh, impactful in determining kind of the features and characteristics of um, the Western mindset and world, which obviously have, um, have dramatically uh, affected the world that we grew up in. And, and some of the, uh, and, and perhaps underscore very subtly and, and at times invisibly, many of the debates and, and arguments and conflicts that Western people and Western countries find themselves in. Um, and, and as a result, uh, relevant to a, a very broad variety of, um, of Section 2 prompts, particularly Task A. Um, do you want to comment a bit more on, on that or your thoughts on that before we kind of go into the details? Uh, yeah. So, you know, like I kind of feel like looking back at history, so, you know, you, you started off in at the historical moment, yeah? So if we're, I'm going to start off at the present moment and look back into the past from here, there's that question as to, you know, how does that looking back look like? You know, what do I see first? What do I see second? What do I see third? Going all the way back. So, for example, you know, you mentioned class uh, stratification and distinctions. Um, Implicated in all of that, this is a time, you know, Europe is still, in a sense, Christendom, right? Uh, it's still Christendom, and within Christendom, it's kind of got a lot of uh, internal uh, problems, a lot of warring factions. The French at the throat of the English, the English at the throat of the French, the Anglican, you know, the, the Protestants at the throat of the Catholics, Catholics at the throats of the Protestants, and so on. So there's so much that's going on in um, in, in, in broader Christendom, in broader, in broader Europe, uh, and it's uh, what's happening is... Um, it's instigating these sorts of thoughts, you know, how do we come together? How do we create a society uh, within which uh, theological um, uh, disagreements, let's say, do not necessarily have to lead to, you know, um, uh, religious wars, uh, 
uh, bloodshed, uh, all these sorts of things, right? So you have class, you also have like, you know, re religious or theological disagreements and that, and you know, this is a time in which religion is deeply interspersed in society, its roots are everywhere. So it's not a mere intellectual abstract theological exercise, right? What, what, what happens at the church affects politics, et cetera, et cetera. It's all bound up um, one, 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 one with the other. So kind of understanding that history and how it comes, you know, how Europe comes apart in certain respects and then how Europe will then branch out and give rise to, you know, uh, what's known today as like the North Atlantic world, yeah, the United States, um, Canada, and, you know, we can include Australia and that as well, like the broader, the broader Anglosphere, what we will call the West, is, is, is a particularly important thing, yeah, especially us as Westerners speaking in English, writing in English about you know, these ideas. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> I want to talk a bit about uh, the, the development of liberalism from classic liberalism uh, to modern liberalism and then neoliberalism uh, and how that arose as an attempt to uh, mediate uh, some of the dissatisfactions of of French people, particularly in the French Revolution. Um, so my understanding, and it may be a bit uh, kind of rough, is essentially that um, there was kind of a, a disenfranchisement and, and a lack of opportunity or poorer life circumstances of the working class uh, in kind of feudal systems or, or monarchies. Um, and, you know, in the French Revolution um, or in France, you had kind of uh, Marie Antoinette and Louis, can't remember the number, eight, seven, um, who were living incredibly wealthy lives while workers were kind of in increasingly being taxed to the point of um, starvation. And this uh, led to an overthrow of the monarchy, a storming of the Bastille and the, and the Palace of uh, Versailles, uh, and ultimately a um, introduction of this idea of, um, of democracy, but also of, of classic liberalism, which uh, in my understanding is essentially the focus on the individual as the central unit of importance versus the family, for example, perhaps in more Asian countries um, or society at large. Uh, and, and kind of positioning the role of a government or a state uh, within those systems as existing simply to um, enfranchise or uh, to preserve the... Uh, the individual's liberty. Have I, have I, I think I've more or less got that right. Is that about there? Yeah, I, I would say like, yeah, you know, the, the, so I would say there's a lot of things that you're, you're writing saying, okay, so your liberty, fraternity, gallery, you know, as, 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 as like a, let's say, not the theoretical impetus, but, you know, I don't want to say the spiritual impetus as well, but like this called the ideational impetus of that movement. There is a debate as, you know, how, you know, how many of these values really did come to crystallize in the post-revolutionary society in the ways in which the revolutionaries would have wanted it to, et cetera. And, you know, what were some of the things that, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, hindered uh, the actual crystallization of those ideas, because a lot of people sort of say, really, it was more a reconfiguration, you know, and it, 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 things, some things did change quite substantially. Other things were really just reconfigured. And so you just had like a new distribution or a new labeling of uh, old realities. But yeah, it's, the truth is somewhere in between the two. Okay. Hmm. But what came out of that, though, ultimately, whether it crystallized at the time, ultimately what landed or made its way from French revolutionaries who participated in the American Revolution to overthrow the British was uh, a seeping of these ideas of liberalism, uh, the free press, capitalism, uh, over to the US and, um, uh, and them being codified or the spirit or fragrance of them being codified in the American Constitution. Uh, and, and the way I see it, which perhaps is embryonic, is... is significantly that that uh, introduced or uh, almost solidified um, this idea of freedom um, and well, not so much freedom but equality and liberalism just this what is it seems become an obsessive focus particularly in the case of America on um, personal liberty uh, my rights you know and and a, perhaps a fanatical obsession with the importance of self versus other um, often uh, in its current forms at the cost of other, which I think goes against uh, the spirit of liberalism, because of course in liberalism, you're not, you're not, the intention is that you do whatever you want, but as long as it doesn't harm another or impact on another person's liberty. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is that more or less? Yeah. Um, is it correct to say that that was the inception of liberalism into the American constitution? Yeah. 
Or have I just made that up and, and, and written about it? <laughs> no, I, I think that's... I think that's a historical point that maybe transcends my expertise, like the exact, you know, genealogy mm -hmm. of the idea and how it will, like, you know, but, but, but there, but what you're talking about, like, I think in general, what you're talking about, there are these broad trends. Yeah. Like, for example, what you've mentioned regarding that internal contradiction, um, or at least tension within liberalism. All right. On the one hand, you can do what you want as long as it doesn't harm anyone else, right? What's come to be known as the harm principle articulated by, um, you know, Mill and other utilitarians. And uh, for a long time, there has been this discussion as to how do you define harm? Because you really can't, in harm itself, what constitutes harm or harming someone or being harmed um, is not an easy thing to pin down. Um, because what might constitute harm to someone is not harm to the other person. And uh, in contemporary discussions of liberalism, you Killing. No. Should be. I think we're having some. And uh, as a result, um, uh, are we having internet? Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna. Uh, it's saying, okay. Sorry, just got a message saying my internet is unstable. Okay, right, I'm gonna hotspot as well, just so um. Um. Is that better? Uh, yeah, I've got you back. I'm on hotspot now, so hopefully that's uh, going to be a bit better for us. Okay, I'm going to quickly switch over to my hotspot as well. Cool. No stress. While you're doing that, I might um, yabber on of kind of how I wanted to connect this liberalism piece. Um, so classic liberalism, which is kind of the, the uh, early forms of liberalism, is characterized by uh, really the statement by William Sumner that the drunkard in the gutter is exactly where he ought to be. So what this... Um, kind of articulates is uh, the idea of a meritocracy, which is to say that a, a society formed um, where in which people are rewarded in proportion to uh, their merit, which is to say what they contribute to the free market. And so it says, and the reason that this importantly was a uh, uh, intended to appease perhaps the working class who before, no matter how much they worked, it was just you're born to that class too bad. Uh, the idea now was, no, you work hard enough, you contribute enough, you'll be rewarded in proportion. So the idea, wonderful. However, unfortunately, it starts to introduce some problems as that kind of plays out when you consider that uh, not everyone kind of starts from the same starting point. As people um, do contribute more, um, get paid more, become wealthy, they, their kids are, are then often able to have better um, educational opportunities, better health care. Um, and so it kind of it, it, or it, it, it uh, kind of makes it that people can't equally participate in the market and have their value truly reflected to them uh, based on their merit. And that's when we get a transition more to modern liberalism, which is uh, pretty much kind of until somewhat recently-ish, or like, you know, let's say the 2000s-ish, wherein the government was given a, uh, where before they had a very minimized role, just the watchman on the hill, they now started to have perhaps the higher esteem of the public and, and are given more rights and responsibilities in mediating people's access to the market. So we've got things like social welfare um, and, and the government definitely in modern liberalism has more of a proactive role uh, in, in people's day-to-day -day life. And really, I think the foundation stone of that Actually, you can probably talk to this, but to me, it seems that the foundation stone of that is kind of uh, optimism, uh, uh, perceptions of procedural fairness uh, on behalf of the government, that they're kind of doing the right thing by everyone. Um, and I think this really started to get perhaps eroded by events like um, WikiLeaks uh, and and perhaps certain wars that, that governments have uh, and ways of operating within those wars um, that, that governments have done. And, um, and I think we're seeing it particularly with, you know, uh, Things like the Black Lives Matter protest and, and increasingly vocal displays of uh, not so much apathy, but even um, contempt of the government. For example, calling Donald Trump Agent Orange. These are things we didn't really see before. And I think that's really what characterizes the final shift to neoliberalism, which is uh, basically, uh, and I will get you actually to comment on this because you know much more about me, but uh, as I understand it, is essentially characterized by um, a desire to return to a minimized uh, role of the government in people's lives, um, a reprivatization of public resources such as the post office and, and transport systems, uh, and basically wanting to kind of claw back some of the um, the powers that governments have been given through modern liberalism. Yeah. So, I mean, like you mentioned quite a few things there, right? Like uh, a lot of that turns around, you know, broader discussions, right? Thing that's 
been happening for some time in ethics and in the philosophy of like morality, right? Philosophy of morality and ethics. You know, you, you mentioned procedural procedural ethics, yeah, that uh, uh, this idea that there is a procedure that we can go through that kind of gives us almost like, in, you know, in some sort of mathematical uh, detached, impartial, objective way, the objective ethical outcome of something. You know, neoliberalism you mentioned, which is interesting because for a long time, you know, it's been touted as a kind of natural theory of economics, right? This is the natural state of affairs. And so if it's natural, that therefore it's kind of like value free or it's neutral. And anything that we, you know, then impose on it is that like human values. Whereas a lot of, you know, people say there is nothing natural. There are substantive values that do in fact underpin a lot of these political and economic theories that are being touted as being completely value free. If you call them value free, then it's like, Nobody can argue with you, but um, the whole point of the critique of them is to say, actually, they do have certain values embedded in them, and we really need to be careful um, about, uh, uh, you know, yeah, letting them sort of, you know, go, go along uh, with this, uh, go along and ingraining this view in the in the broader public or even in academic literature, in public policy, in think tanks, as you know, this sort of value-free or neutral idea. So, neoliberalism. The idea of liberal is there, the idea of freedom is there, but freedom for who, right? Freedom for who and from who is an important question that we have to ask. Because, you know, as, as is known in the, in the theory of liberal ethics, like, yeah, you can, you know, we, we are free to do things and free from certain things. So when you apply that same logic to the question of economics, who is free to do what and who is free from what, you know, and, and when you, if you read Chomsky and others, they'll go into detailed analysis of this as to, you know, the, the so-called free trade and, you know, uh, um, uh, opening the markets. And if there's a, there's a country that doesn't want to open its markets because for whatever internal reason it has a, a local population to take care of, uh, then, you know, it is against freedom, you know, and if it's against freedom, you know, it's against something that is objectively, substantively, absolutely beautifully good, right? And so therefore can be the object of our um, uh, uh, anger and resentment and even our tanks and, and, and drones and, and everything like that. Right? So, yeah. Hmm. Should I want you to go, um, I know if I let you, you'll go deep and deep and deep and deep and deep and deep and deep and, and you have the ability to go so far into these topics. Um, can you help me or help the people watching this video uh, cohere these um, <clears throat> kind of these big ideas like liberalism, capitalism, uh, the free press and, and the free market and meritocracy and, and all these different ideas. Rather going deep, uh, can you help us go kind of yeah. horizontal rather than, than vertical? And can you locate each of these things in their context in relation to each other and in relation to the world around us so that when a student gets uh, a prompt they can kind of come to some kind of awareness of uh, and I've, i know this is a big ask in a short period but just some kind of introduction that's, that's kind of high level um so that they can locate or begin to locate prompts within their proper context of these different ideas and talk about the prompt with reference to these ideas such that they can um come across to the marker as someone that is well informed about the world around them and and is considered about the various factors that, that go into whatever it is that they're discussing because i yeah. think that's going to help them score much higher yeah that is a big ask <laughs> like, it, is, it, is, it really is honestly <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't ask anyone but you um, yeah. all right so um uh that's what i kind of tried to do with that narrative you know and show people how did we get to liberalism and then what is the repercussions of um this emphasis on yeah. the individual you know, yeah. how does that relate to democracy um, and participation in democracy and capitalism and the shift towards neoliberalism okay so and even things like cancel culture and virtue signaling yeah. and these so you know like let's 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 maybe take this apart bit by bit i'm just going to say things in relation to the things i've heard you said and try to you know thread it all together so you can talk about participatory uh, um uh, politics yeah uh, this idea that you know there isn't maybe one person or a select group of people who have who are invested with this absolute power with which to make decisions for everyone, but there's a sense in which you know demos or democracy rule by the people, right? The rule and the ruler are one and the same, so to speak. Yeah, and that of course we still have represent we still have represent representative democracy. We have people who represent us, represent our views, take it to the appropriate legislative bodies, uh, parliamentary bodies, debating houses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know a lot of that is going to go back, you know, to things. That we had said earlier right like in terms of the history of europe and it's uh, it, it's it's bad history it's bad past with the abuses of power in what they 
mm. would now say uh, and said back then were arbitrary investments of power, right? The divine, the, the divine um, uh, right of kings, right? To rule, right? So you're a king, you're, bo you're born to his family, you become a prince, you become the king. The king is embedded with uh, the ecclesiastical classes, the, um, uh, the priesthood, as it were. So you now you have king and God on the same throne, as it were. And who dare challenge such an earthly and heavenly authority, right? Mm -hmm. This obviously is going to, annoy, you know, with time, uh, like you mentioned, uh, bring about all kinds of, you know, this and other factors. Like it's very important just to, because I, I say other factors because it's very important because sometimes in a reductionist analysis, students are going to be like, oh yeah, see, <laughs> religion, bad, glad we got rid of that. You know, um, that's why Europe was, you know, in, back, in, in, in this backward state. Of the important thing of is though, that the religion, that the... <clears throat> the power that they were invested with by virtue of the um, uh, esteem that religion had at the time and, and the king was perhaps um, primed countries led by these systems for um, mis mismanagement. Um, abuse, yeah, definitely abuse of power, mismanagement, uh, you know, uh, and, because, and within that also, you know, like to be fair, you, you have internal discussions, right? It's not like as if every uh, priest or Christian philosopher or whatever was just sort of sitting back and be like, yes, we fully agree with this divine right of kings and, you know, we fully agree with this, uh, this particular distribution of power. No, there was a lot of internal discussion, but at the same time also, the, you know, the, the church and the priestly classes were you know, interested in, in consolidating earthly power, right, for what they might have seen as, you know, um, heavenly or other other earthly ends. Um, but like, you know, like, yeah, that's going to come all the way to what we will call the modern period, right? And like, I think here there's three words that might be useful to, to use. One is modern, one is modernity, and one is modernism, yeah? So if we start with modernism, the ideology of modernity and everything that goes underneath that, right? So, you know, whether it's the various political ideologies that come to the fore and are now competing, in you know competing for a space in the new world right in the post Which ideologies yeah. are we talking about here are you are you talking about like socialism capitalism yeah, yeah socialism liberalism capitalism marx and marx and, uh, you know uh, uh marxism everything or communism everything of that sort that characterized a lot of the 20th century the 19th century etc that's sort of growing into that right yeah. in, in 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 the new so saying that the, this, this abuse of power by the um by the the, the kind of or the, or the combination of of the um, I can't even say is it a class ecclesiast ecclesiastical yeah ecclesiastical yeah. and and the and the king uh, abuse of power led to are you saying kind of led to or resulted in these various um, ideas which characterise uh, modernity which are, which are attempts to uh, balance or mediate or um, deal with some of the inequities uh, uh, that arose from those previous systems and, and they're trying to do it in various ways um partly like the, the, those systems these ideologies that would, we could put them under modernism are trying to deal with a lot of things partly and many of which you know we inherit you know the europe or west we, uh, the western world is going to inherit from what that from what the old setup was like yeah um uh, you know, like I me, mean, the old setup was feudalism, right? It was a feudalistic setup as well, right? You'd had the kings, the nobles, the serfs, the nobles owned the wealth, the king owns everything, uh, and the serfs are owned by, you know, th th that middle class. And so, you know, okay, how do we transition out of such a unfair, you know, economic and political social stratification? All that sort of stuff and of course today people will be like well you know sure the living standards may have increased but we still look like 2600 people own own more wealth than 4.6 billion people that's you know are we back to we're back to my sister was telling me that it's it's like the the, the wealth inequality today is it is worse than pre-revolutionary france right <laughs> so it's like so so much for so much for that right like back to a kind of neo a neo-feudalistic um enterprise or age even though we don't see it because you know nobody is hungry in that sense right so like what maybe is uh, you know what we stand to lose is not like you're not starving you're not like in charles dickens's tale of two cities you know that the scene where the, the the wine caskets break and people are so hungry that they just all run to the streets and they're, they're drinking up the wine as it's uh, you know as it intermixes with the mud and it's just like a it's a very powerful scene in this book but it, it demonstrates yeah how starved the people are for their basic you know nutrition whereas today you know i mean again we've got to be careful how we speak about this because maybe for us you know i come to your place we eat like steak twice a day or whatever the case may be easy for us to do that right but for a lot of people in other places you know um I mean, like, you know, just some of the images you see, right, like what's happening in Yemen or whatever the case may be, there are like a, there's a substantive group of humanity that you know, is very much living in perhaps worse conditions, you know, uh, than uh, what, what we just described. So, yeah.
All right, so where we're at so far is we've got um, <clears throat> previous abuse of power by um, the monarchy and ecclesiastical class uh, and, to a degree, attempts to rectify some of those inequities via systems of liberalism, which is intending to in, uh, empower an individual to kind of make their own way uh, through <clears throat> meritocratic ideas and, and that the free market is going to reflect back to them their wealth. We've also got other ideas that arose out of the Russian Revolution, such as socialism and communism, uh, which arise out of Marxism, and they are attempts to kind of get rid of wealth and say, oh, you know, if the person who loves to make shoes makes shoes and the farmer who makes peaches loves to make peaches makes peaches and, you know, the shoemaker wants a peach and, and the peach maker wants a shoe, they just trade. Um, uh, and, and so it seems to me that kind of the 20th century was characterised by various attempts um, by different nations to help humans realise their potential and also to kind of um, counterbalance or... Um, I can't find the word. In some way, empower humans to, to live uh, in a way that... Uh, or through a system that doesn't result in uh, the inequities and, and tragedies that, that came before. Um, and each doing that to various degrees, but ultimately liberalism uh, being the most successful. Can you comment on <clears throat> the relate? Pardon me. The relationship between democracy uh, and liberalism, perhaps in more of a flourished way than my uh, very basic understanding, which is that the intention of democracy uh, is to uh, in, uh, not enable but facilitate uh, or actualize uh, the intents of liberalism in to the extent that liberalism focuses on the individual as a unit of importance and democracy just says, right, well, if everyone in their local, you know, in my council gives there and the majority is represented by this person, then, you know, the local council member should represent as well as possible the majority opinion of that. And then it goes up and up and up all the way to, to the, uh, the prime minister. And the hope or intention is that this enfranchises or gives the say of the most amount of people possible, such that we're preserving as much individual liberty as possible. Is that is that kind of the heart of it or I mark that up as well? So I, I suppose that would be like, so there's internal discussions within political theory, you know, when it comes to democracy, right? So imagine like 51% are in favour, 49% are not like, sure, this, you know, you do have 1% more and you want this, what do you do? Do you go ahead? And I, most Democrat, a lot of Democrats are going to be like, well, no, right? You need to have some degree of substantive support. And it's, it's not only also just a numbers game, right? Because like you had sort of said, you know, um, in, in, a, in a number of contemporary Western liberal societies, there is a growing realization and acknowledgement that, you know, liberalism is not a... Uh, a the, guy, the watchman on the hill kind of thing, but it's a quite an invested, you know, a stakeholder, right? It's a, there, there is values that are being that are that are operative and, and at play. So you know, um, in a in a in a country like, for example, um, take for example, like just the difference between France and the UK when it comes to re, uh, uh, certain values like secularism, right? So in France, uh, secularism. It's a kind of like anti-religious secularism because of a particular history that France has had with religion, right? That we've sort of gone through a little bit here. So can you define um, secularism? Oh, I actually can't. It's very tough. But you can imagine you know, secularism to just mean like uh, societies that aren't religious. Is that more so, or less? So, you know, like uh, the, I think in the Bible, there's a verse, you know, render unto God what is God's and unto Caesar what is Caesar's, right? So this idea that, you know, that there is a sense in which, you know, uh, the world and your actions in the world, at least according to you know, maybe one particular reading of the Bible is going to say, yeah, that uh, not every action is imbued with, as it were, religious significance, or that there is a set of actions that, you know, um, uh, can be done even by non-religious peoples, right? The, the secular state, yeah? The sort of things that we might in, engage with and interact, uh, you know, in the sort of interactions we might have uh, between one another that um, uh, are not immediately or obviously or relevantly or have to be in the mind of maybe a secular person connected to God. If they don't believe in God, they don't believe in a particular religion, they still might go about living their lives in a particular kind of way. Secularism, you know, if you think about it, like is the separation of church and state, you know, uh, that's a one way in which it's uh, sometimes described. But it's a it's it's not an easy thing to pin down exactly what's. It, it's a big discussion. Of what's we don't need the dead black. Like, yeah. I just wanted, like when we're talking about things, I just wanted to. So, so the like, so, in its proper place in the context of what you're saying. Yeah, so like in the UK, however, it's not an anti-religious form of secularism. It's just a a religious form of secularism. You could almost be like, uh, you know, um, religion belongs in the private sphere, as it were, and the public sphere is a place where another set of values are going to hold sway. And so you just see, you just see the difference between these two conceptions of a general theory of secularism, how um, 
that might play out, you know, in the public sphere, right? Um, you might not be able to wear, you know, uh, a necklace with a cross or a headscarf in France when you're going to a particular venue. You might be asked to leave. You might, you know, um, whatever. Whereas in the UK, it might be fine, right? Um, so that domain of public engagement and interaction. The question is, yeah, what values are operative there, and who gets to decide, right? So even within a liberal society, um, who gets to decide what values are operative there? Um, so yeah, that's, I think like you know. That, doesn't it just go to two thirds majority, and is that, isn't that the idea of democracy? I don't. I, that's part of it, but I don't think it will be that straightforward, right? There would always be, and there's always a substantive uh, set of values that are kind of like you know, um, uh, deeply embedded in liberalism itself, right? So, for example, if there was a two third majority, let's say, who voted for the suppression of some minority in a way that contradicted some you know, fundamental liberal tenets, you know, uh, then that could potentially pose a problem to even, like, that will be like, you know, in fascism, like, oh, yeah, let's, let's literally do this, right? Let's do this to them. And you'd be like, mm-hmm. can you relate this to gay marriage? I feel like there's an intersection here between these ideas and how li- kind of the triumph of liberalism in the context of gay marriage, um, <clears throat> um, almost in spite of what seemed like, or what was for <laughs> forever until recently uh, was, uh, kind of brutal um, uh, subjugation of of gay people. So, so what's the question exactly? Sorry. So <clears throat> it seems like what you're saying is there's some kind of operative value within liberalism, wherein uh, it's it's not as simple as majority rule. And uh, if it were the case that the majority did indeed rule for something that. Uh, contravened a fundamental tenet of liberalism, which is to say that there was a class of people, no matter how small uh, or how hated, that were having their fundamental liberty taken from them, even when what they were doing wasn't um, uh, an affront to somebody else's liberty, um, that, 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 that there'd be some kind of aspect of liberalism that would triumph in the face of majority opinion. And it seems to me that that is exactly what happened with um I'm kind of some of the biggest triumphs I feel. I suppose that's subjective, but you know the Black Lives Matter, even pre, even pre then desegregation of black schools, the suffragettes, uh, uh, gay marriage. It seems like the what kind of arose <clears throat> over the 20th century was kind of a and 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 until now a, a series of wins for the small guy, you know, for, for want of a better word. And, and perhaps some of the, the more positive aspects of liberalism is the way that it has enfranchised these groups or given them opportunity that they might um, previously have uh, have had uh, obfuscated from them. Yeah, so this goes back to, I think, you know, like just a, the bigger question, which is, you know, what is the good life, right? And, in you know, within liberal societies, the, uh, the assumption is that, you know, we're not here to tell you what the good life is. We're here to try to facilitate a state of affairs in which everyone can, and see, this is where it gets tricky, right? Where everyone can uh, seek what the good life might be to them. Now, that would, like, on, on, on the one side, that's a very extreme thing. The, like, you know, like I said, in the beginning, it might have been like a completely, you know, you can do whatever you want kind of thing, as long as not harming other people. But now, um, because like we sort of said, the notion of harm becomes a bit difficult to pin down you do come to a point where liberalism is going to be like, all right, you know, we do have to sort of say certain substantive things about what is harming people and what is not harming people. Right. So, uh, I mean, with the issue of gay marriage, like it's going to be in a liberal society, such as like Australia, where it's going to be like, you know, we're not here to tell you what the good life is. So we can't tell you that you can't do that because we can't tell you what the good life is. And it's really trying to create a set of affairs in which, um, you know, uh, as many people can live without, their rights being, you know, imposed and infringed on others. But it does become tricky, right? Because, for example, um, imagine you have, like, in these societies, minorities who have different values. Like, um, you have a Christian community, you have a gay community. And if, for example, there is a shared space that they inhabit, education spaces, let's say, um, there is always going to be a conflict of interest, right? Because one group is going to want to have their particular values instantiated there, or at least they w- they're going to want to be safe from the influence of another set of values right and vice versa so these are continual uh these are constant internal social conflicts within liberal societies and we kind of read about this all the time on the news right um between you know um a broken gay community and, and sometimes the christian uh, community here um but would it extend to other religious communities as well um but those communities are still too small to maybe have a substantive say in things too
you know. So it's interesting. Like there's a lot of this. There's a lot of this going on underneath all this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you know, we've discussed. I think we, we've 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 done a good job of. Do you, is there anything that you think is worth commenting on about the transition from modern liberalism to neoliberalism, or how neoliberalism is different in its aims, intentions, or outcomes than uh, the way that we've characterized liberalism and democracy in relation to it? Um, so, so liberalism would be like the broader term to describe a whole host of ideas that we would fit under there. Neoliberalism will be a particular, it's a political economic instantiation of certain liberal ideas, right? And we saw that play, play, we see that played out in the political and economic field, <clears throat> and the social and cultural. Like it definitely spills over into all of those as well. Cool. So we've covered a lot of big ideas. I think we've talked about liberalism, its relationship to democracy. We've kind of contrasted uh, how. Uh, Liberalism and, and representative democracies uh, try and achieve the aim of, of maximizing uh, human outcomes and human happiness uh, in a different way than socialism uh, and communism. Uh, we've kind of discussed about some of the, the history of how we got at modernity and, some of, and the reason for the existence of some of these ideas. Um, I think probably the last thing that, that would be useful to give the students uh, of 90 plus a uh, kind of a primer or a base understanding to, to operate from about the world around us very, very simplistically uh, is uh, how are some of the uh, cultural and social features of um, Contemporary societies, particularly Western societies, uh, such as technology um, and ideas like uh, virtue signaling, uh, cancel culture, uh, social media, how do you think that these uh, particular, and, and I know that's very, I've just named a whole bunch of things, but how are these uh, making a world or fashioning a world that is unique from what came prior and what implications does this have for people that live in this world and possibly for the future? So what I'm probably getting at here is is perhaps some of the, the siloing of personal opinion based on uh, the way that uh, social media companies will deliver information preferentially to people to maximize uh, the attention that they give in response, regardless of the veracity or truthfulness of that information, um, how this means that we're no longer kind of operating from a common uh, epistemic or ontological framework uh, within uh, about debate. You know, so before everyone just got the news and you debate whatever you want, you know, from a common understanding of the news. But now the news is not the news anymore because everyone gets their own news. Um, and how this then uh, kind of characterizes the, it seems, increasingly um, confrontational uh, political atmospheres that, that we find ourselves in on our online world and even in the world physically. Yeah, like, uh, you know, there's that term echo chambers, like everyone is in their own echo chamber, right? And yeah. yeah. Uh, we can only hear what they want to hear and uh, read what they want to read and see what they want to see. Um, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a tough time in that we're just we're overloaded with things. Yeah. It's like sensory, like just too much stimulation. There's just way too many things we're seeing, way too many things we're reading. How do you decide what, you know, what's, what's your decision theoretic um, principle, you know, by, by virtue of which you go be like, I need to read this and I need to read this and I need to read this. I need to follow a particular structure. If I'm going to build a coherent understanding of the world, because if you're just reading sporadically, randomly, whatever comes up in your feed, yeah, uh, it's it, by virtue of what principle really are you filtering what is true and from what is not true. And, you know, they've sort of said we live in a post-truth age where really truth is not even the factor that moves things along anymore, right? It really is like, a, it, it is like you had said, a, a preference satisfaction of some kind. This mm. article makes me feel good about myself, about my group, mm. about my whatever. Yeah. That article doesn't unfollow, right? Or, or cancel, <laughs> or whatever the case may be. Yeah. You know, or you know, chuck my laptop off the you know, off the balcony, like something. Like it's like you, we do. It's, it's like despite all the the the, the high polluting claims to democracy and to education and to open mindedness and to liberalism and to blah blah blah, blah, blah uh, We are a, I think, a people's uh, growing grow, grow to be a, a people who are more and more close minded in various respects and. Um, you know, in the Orwellian sense, not even aware of, or not even aware of that. Yeah, we don't even know that we don't even know anymore. So, because it is an age where everyone is satisfied with their own opinions. Uh, Chris Hedges, you know, he has a nice phrase. He calls it the um, the cult of the self. Right? It is a cult of the self. Like our self is is, is a cult uh, uh, unto itself. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's a very dangerous uh, prospect. 
So, yeah. And do you think, it seems to me that uh, this is a, <clears throat> a feature or an outcome of capitalism. And what I mean by that is the, uh, I remember you once, was it you that described to me social media as the panopticon? Um, and and the way that the uh, social media has become, uh, panopticon, by the way, is a, a, a conceptual prison, uh, which is a, a kind of a guard tower surrounded uh, on all sides by kind of a circular uh, prison, uh, which has one-way mirrors. So the prisoners are all in kind of a circle facing inwards to this uh, guard tower, but because of the one-way mirror, they can never see when they're being watched. Yeah. Um, but the the fact of always feeling like they're being watched regulates their behavior. So it seems that social media has become a panopticon of sorts in, in, in to the degree to which they are um, spying and, and profiling us uh, in order to sell back to us what we're most likely to buy. And they're using kind of these rich um, uh, digital exhaust of our kind of behavioral cues and, and monetizing them uh, for profit. And, and that's why when you get, uh, when it becomes the case that someone pays more attention to something that they want to hear um, and there's a financial impetus to deliver that to them, you get um, yeah. yeah these different realities being proffered to people based on what they want to hear. Um, which just you know puts gasoline on the fire of political debate, and but importantly though makes it more and more incommensurable. We we, we don't seem to have any ability anymore to to regulate um, or, or come to agreements or even operate within any kind of disagreement, and we become siloed based on our opinions. Um, and social media is the bloodiest you know battlefield, just yeah. under the boot of of dogma. Uh, it is squelched the muddied corpse of any opportunity of 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 coming to agreement or negotiating disagreement. It seems that people will. It's called virtue signaling. I understand they'll, they'll they'll state their opinion in such a way that it's not actually inviting debate or discussion. It's just they want to put their flag in the ground and go, no, this is what I believe, and there's no you, you're not allowed to disagree. Or if you do, then we have cancel culture, wherein you will discredit what someone said based on their history, not actually the points that they're that they they've yeah, made. And it, it makes things yeah. impossible. It does. I mean, so you know, in, in the beginning, it was like. Imagine that the pre-modern world, God is at the center of the universe. Then we remove God, enlightenment, man is at the center of the universe. Now we remove, remove the man. Now it's like every single one of us. Uh, <laughs> Literally. Like, this is the, the cult of the self, right? I saw this article. I, I saw this app on my Facebook um, feed you know, speaking about social media. And it was like, it was so interesting the way it was advertised. Yeah, It was an app about knowledge. Learn more things, but it was advertised. Become the most interesting person in the room. <laughs> yeah. It's not about no, no stuff. It's about yeah. then it becomes so interesting that you can just be there discoursing in these exquisite, you know, remarks. And everyone's like, wow, man, what's that person saying? You know what I mean? It's like, so it's it's not, it's no longer about truth. It's no longer about the pursuit of truth was the fundamental quest of philosophy, right? And mm. from philosophy, so we're gonna get all these other branches of knowledge, you know, um, in the science and so on. So now it's like truth is like a swear word. it's a cuss word like oh that's i remember when i was at union I, said, yeah. I was asked by one of my philosophy professors why are you here i, I don't even want to call him a philosophy professor the man was a complete anyway it was like um <laughs> he was like why are you here and i was like um, to, 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 to pursue the truth and he just looked at me he's like the truth it's like and he's like what do you mean the truth and i'm like well you know you mean i paid all this money as an international student to come here for some other purpose like you know what i mean it's like i'm not paying you just like give me nonsense it's like so for him in his mind is like there's no such thing as the truth the capital t there are your truths my truths her truths which really don't it's, it's just it's a it's a social convention of being polite you know what i mean mm -hmm. um uh, and it's you no know, it's, it's not about is this the case or is it not the case kind of thing you know what i mean so when you when you when you remove the possibility of speaking about you know um at least you know to to, to be uh sensitive to a within the context of what language can provide when you remove the possibility of um speaking about truth within the, within those parameters, then uh, you do invite the uh, the specter of um, the specter of nihilism because nihilism is really a thesis of the lack of meaning, and the lack of meaning is a, is a th is an extended thesis about the inability for us to actually communicate something substantive between each other. You know what I mean? That there is a shared commonality of meaning that I can actually we can both 
that there's a shared world of meaning that we can both, you know, get at. Even though we might be getting at different perspectives, but we get it, we speak about it, and then we'd be like, all right, yeah, that is the case. You know, we can say something meaningful about it. But in the in the in the age of the self or the cult of the self, uh, you know, um, where every tram that you see has an ad like "be you." do you, you know what I mean? It, it sense it's you, 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 right? And it's not anything. So, you know, you can kind of see like, it's very, whether individualism will be this hyper-individualism or this narcissism that we can you know, see nowadays or, you know, um, the, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because they've done studies to show that like a lot of people uh, in, in various respects in relation to various uh, uh, practices and self-perceptions have a much higher view of themselves and their value than maybe other people have of them right and i think that's that's quite telling you know what i mean that we sometimes do have a uh, maybe an overinflated you know you, you've seen that right michael that, that that graph like you know competency and and, and knowledge and like you know like little comp little knowledge like you have a, yeah. a sense of competency right like a great yeah, yeah. competency and so like you know that's how it is man it's a tough time where our education systems don't make it any better like you know you talked about the commercialization of knowledge and education well i mean like this is the same thing that's happened to a lot of our you know universities right they followed the american model where you can't really you know get educated in three years oh why because you know well the university can squeeze a bit more juice out of you right and of course the university will have extended pedagogic justifications for why you need to go and do this and this and this and this um, and in certain cases maybe those justifications might be warranted but then there's always this constant question as to how much of this education is really being commercialized, you know, in a financially monetized? And I think part of the proof of that is look at how all these humanities departments across the world in many universities are shutting down. I think in Japan, if I'm not mistaken, I think they shut down humanities departments in so many places, except the University of Tokyo, right? Because of its prestigious humanities department. But so many other places, like these are useless skills, <laughs> you know, and we're going to be like, no, if you lose those skills, you're going to lose the possibility of ever retaining getting back to whatever taught, told you that these skills were important. You, you know, you lose something almost irrevocably. And that's one of the scariest things, you know, that you have to contend with you know, in, these, in these states of affairs. Bro, we might wrap it up there. That was, um, right. that was super it. good, actually. I feel like we're going to need to do um, some more of this, but I'm really happy with what we achieved, actually. I, I feel like that's at least a grounding in or a mention of many of the uh, ideas that are going to, in my experience, they characterize really good section two writing. You know, it's one thing to be able to uh, <clears throat> have a cogent reply um, that perhaps uh, psychometrically profiles you in a favorable way uh, and to do so with style. Um, but, you know, what I really think separates perhaps the 60s from the 70s is the use of ideas and the 70s from the 80s is perhaps uh, specifics. Um, and, and to be very precise about the way that we use those ideas and enfold our ideas in other people's ideas. So I think familiarity with some of these broader ideas and writing with reference to them is something that's probably one of the biggest things that, that will help students kind of clean up some, um, some much easier GAMSAT marks. Uh, before we wrap it up, uh, if someone's watching this that doesn't know, uh, Shabir and I run a Facebook group at the Section 2 Sorted group. Uh, we... Uh, Tudor students and, and Mark Essays there for free. Uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're going to continue to do podcasts like this. Uh, and both Shabir and I now offer tutoring. Uh, formerly, it was just me that, done, that did it, uh, but the kind of workload has increased and I couldn't think of anyone better than Shabir, the guy who got me uh, that score uh, to come and help you guys. Um, so we're absolutely privileged to have you on board. Thank you for agreeing to do it. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to doing more of these sessions uh, with you, Shabir. Yeah, uh, thanks. Cool, cool. All right, guys. Um, thank you so much. You will hear from us shortly, I'm sure, and hopefully see you uh, on the group. Hit like and subscribe. Thank you very much, guys. All the best. Take care.